So really this session is just to, I guess, um, move on with some of the discussion we started in the field and this morning. Um, really like to explore, you know, what are some of the barriers to um, growers taking up ag tech? Um, and so I'd probably like to throw that question to each of you, uh, potentially starting with Chris. Um, yeah, just in your experience, Chris, what are some of the barriers that you've found to, to growers taking up ag tech? I know it's a very broad question, but let's just kick it off there. Um, well, I suppose one thing I'd quickly start off with is when we say barriers to ag tech, I don't want to be too semantic, but what is ag tech? I actually think there's a lot of growers, and I'm probably being more specific to small, medium sized enterprises, they're actually using a lot of ag tech already. It's just to how we perceive it. A lot of, I look around this room and a lot of people are already using ag tech, researchers, developers, obviously ag tech companies, uh, you know, a handful of small growers here. Um, I think a lot of it has to be driven by curiosity, but also a need, it's been talked about. But to be more specific, I guess that's that question in terms of barriers to adoption. Um, I think perceived cost is absolutely one of them. Uh, the other is, I guess that, as I think Robin mentioned, there's this plethora of, of I guess, discussion and technologies out there, and it looks quite mind-boggling at the moment, and I think you all know that, and I think as providers, you need to try and, I guess, think more carefully about the benefits, is probably my piece of advice. Good old Steve Jobs. It, um, we hear a lot about the features. We don't always hear about the benefits, but also trying to, join the dots and show that benefit to that individual enterprise. Um, we can talk about, you know, it saves money, you can go on holidays. Uh, I certainly don't always see that. And I think sometimes we're seeing a promise being sold, not a benefit specific to that enterprise, backed up with case studies and to be sort of um, showing it in real terms, if that makes any sense. So uh, there, there are, I guess, many barriers um, I think the other one is patience. We all need to be patient. This is not going to happen in five years. There's a big, big frenzy, I think, in the last five to ten years. Um, that's often what happens when new things come in. Um, it will take time. It'll be a progressive thing. Yeah. I've only got a very simple one. It's fear of overwhelming of how much to do. As a grower, just take on one. Just take on what you can do. Um, the, the industry's got too much going on for, or for me anyway, and just narrow it down to one. That's all I've really got. I think we've been doing ag tech for many, many years. I sort of look at the research station here, and it started in 1937, and it started off in the horse and cart days, and you know, you sort of look where we are today, and over all those years, there's been ag tech happening um, through all the different generations. We just have to look at, um, I guess, manual pruning. We started off with hand snips, saws, We've gone to air snips, and now we've gone to electric snips, uh, and now we're going to snips where we don't even have to carry a um, battery. It's got its battery all uh, inbuilt. You know, and this is all ag tech moving forward. Um, and so what we've got today in ag tech, 10 years down the track, it may be old fashioned again, and there may be new ag tech coming along all the time. So um, um, I, I guess, you know, like myself, I've been in the industry, grape industry now for 40 odd years. And what I've seen develop from, you know, the early days of irrigation when we we're uh, flood irrigating, using soaker hoses and just irrigating everything and using ball water, salty ball water, um, we've gone away from that now and we've got, you know, latest technology with drip irrigation and um, the build water scheme and um, also um, um, soil moisture probes and uh, there's just so much new things coming along all the time. So um, I think, yeah, we've just got to keep moving forward in uh, all the um, latest gadgets and gizmos that uh, come out all the time and uh, help us uh, along our way. But at the end of the day, I think we're all still growing pretty good grapes in the brosser and, uh, uh, and making some damn good wines, actually. So it's great to see. Good. Thanks, guys. A any questions now from the audience? Hi. Uh, yeah, Joe here from Onsite. I have a question um, in regard to grape growers being stakeholders in ag tech, obviously. Um, how, what's your perception of how they like to take on board information about ag tech? So if we go back, you know, 20 years ago, it was probably the case of if you didn't go to a field day, you didn't get to see the new stuff. Nowadays, we're all quite busy, and I'm wondering what your take is on how potential customers to ag tech would like to get that information. 
I, I guess you always get some growers who are always very forward-thinking growers, and as soon as something new comes on the scene, they jump on it straight away. Uh, then you'll get others who are more reserved, and they'll sort of sit back and wait to see um, how it will develop. And um, you know, quite often, eventually, even the reserve growers will jump on stream down the track. But um, um, yeah, it's, um, there's always a few out there that, you know, as soon as something new comes along, let's do it, let's go for it. So. You've got to see value for it. Um, of where it's going to go. There's, there's some, some technology that you may get a dollar value out. This year we put mock sorters on our harvesters. Um, it's worked really well. The winery's made fantastic comments for it. We jumped on, on board that technology. But are we going to get paid more money? Don't know, but we'd like to think we're in front of, we're in front of the pack for doing that. But no, benefit. Um, so probably sound a bit corny. Sometimes do not call it egg tech. Yeah. <laughs> I think you probably know what I mean by that, but if someone rocks up, I've got the latest technology, there'll be people out there who are, they'll be the, the late majority, they may be the laggards. So it, there's an incredibly diverse audience and we know agricultural, broadly speaking, is pretty conservative, risk averse, cautious. So um, there is no one size fits all. I, I think you probably know the answer to it, to, to your question, but certainly demonstrating real value, I think is James's point, and um, making sure people appreciate that it's not going to be intimidating. I've seen people being intimidated by some new, new technologies. They don't trust their own capability sometimes, and, and you really need to walk them through it and, I guess, um, make people realise you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to... Um, What's the word? Spend hours at it, and that's probably the other thing. Occasion, I think people go, "Hang on, that looks awesome," and I understand all the things it could do. I don't want to sit in the office for three hours every morning trying to make sense of it before I go out in the field. So it's got to be quick. And you know, one of the best bits of ag tech is, is these things. Um, so it does, not everything has to be on that platform, but but Jesus, I can tell you, it's used massively now. We, you know, if all our mobile networks shut down, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> Just keep it simple. Just keep the language down for people. Um, like out there today, you hear these acronyms coming through. Um, that's fantastic for people in this room, but that person that's not here, they just want to hear the basics. They just want to understand what you're talking about and yeah, one step at a time. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I heard a lot of technical talk out there today. Didn't hear as many benefits. Um, and it's the benefits that the growers want to hear about, not the actual technology and how it works, um, always. So uh, that's something I would say. Um. Yeah, we, we, we want to be able to just see it on, on the screen um, and, um, and then be able to read it in uh, layman's terms and uh, use that information to um, help us in our everyday de decisions as um, uh, vineyard managers, actually. And uh, yeah, so uh, it just needs to be um, plain, simple and easy to understand. And I think the term AI is that's misused a lot, as I think you tech people know better than me. Um, we, we won't get in the semantics of machine learning and AI, but I think sometimes too that just kind of straight away feels very theoretical. So look, I'll, I'll give you a quick example at the risk of be upsetting someone, but if someone comes along and says, I can use satellite imagery to tell you the pH of your grape crop today, you'll have a lot of trouble selling that to a winemaker. They will not trust it. It's as simple as that. But it's an adjunct to what we normally do Absolutely. So the idea occasionally if someone says, oh, we can do this and you'll never have to go and do that job, don't bet on it. Ground truthing is the other thing I see a real lack of. So, so probably comments, more questions, but be interested to know what your reaction is. I've heard a lot of discussion today about cost. And as somebody said before, almost no discussion at all about benefit. And the fact of the matter is that the capital cycle of an average vineyard is 30 years and in the Barossa, as everybody would know, particularly if you've been to Turkey Flat or Langmile, it might be over 100 years. So there's a strong incentive for people to sort of uh, reconsider the consideration of cost and, and think about the value. Because if, for instance, you want to use a piece of ag tech for improving your yield estimation and you currently estimate your yield with let's, for the sake of argument, say an error of 10 or 15%, if by spending some money on a system that allows you to do that with an error of about 3%, and also you don't any longer have to 
use your own labour or the labour of your staff to do that, then maybe the benefit significantly outweighs the cost. But until people start thinking about the value of the information that they get from ag tech, we're not going to change the, the, the way people think about that. The other thing that occurs to me, and, and by the way, I've been working in ag tech for over 20 years, admittedly from a research perspective, but uh, everybody talks about associated with the cost, the annual subscription, for which is, which is pretty much confined to a cost associated with data curation. It goes up to the cloud, there's a real advantage in that because it's backed up, but all of these various proprietary systems have data subscriptions that result in the data residing somewhere where, as we've heard, the grower nonetheless owns it and can withdraw it, but nonetheless it's somewhere else. But I'd suggest that growers don't actually want lots of discrete systems. They want a system for managing their data, and that system needs to be able to handle both the sort of point data that comes out of a moisture probe, but also map data that might be generated, for example, from remotely sensed imagery, yield mapping, if anybody ever picks that up again, or a whole range of other spatial type applications. And I don't see this changing much whilst the ag tech companies insist on their own proprietary systems. So I'd be encouraging growers and their advisors, like the guys sitting up at the front, to be demanding a bit of a change there. It's all very well for one company to say that its API can be read into Swan Systems or whoever else's system it might happen to be, but that still involves the use of a proprietary system. And, and somebody mentioned Hans Loder earlier on, who's building his own system. Very few people are going to want to do that, but we need to have much greater portability of data, and I don't think that will happen until the market demands it. So. I'd encourage people who are interested in this stuff to start getting a bit noisier and possibly angrier and demanding the sort of technology that actually serves their needs. I know Ollie Madgett is, has a group together to look at that collaboration of data, Rob. Um, so if anyone does want to get involved in that, I've got Ollie's details, you can join that group. That's one place to start anyway. There's another question over the back here. Yeah, hello there. Uh, like, like Rob, who I thoroughly respect, I've been working in ag tech for 20 odd years also, but on the commercial side as a supplier. But I uh, understand Rob's question, but there is an aspect that data storage um, needs to generally be in the cloud for, for it to be available on your phone. Like the presenters up here said, they want it available in their hand. If it's stored on their own computer, um, it's just like me trying to sign in to look at my video of my dog last night while I was out at dinner and the Wi-Fi has fallen off the bench and now I can't access the data because it's stored, you know, I'm, I'm using it from, a, from, a, from my own source. So I think it's, um, th these cloud services are the, there is a reason that all the companies are going that way. It's, it's, it's cheap, bang for buck for the benefits of, uh, of being stored in the cloud. Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, they're all there for a reason. I had a question for Robin. Yeah, I, just in your presentation, you said if growers want to come and have a look around the ag tech here another day, and obviously Roger's quite familiar with it now, but who gives them that tour and how does that all work? And um, So it depends on, obviously, for here, um, we do have Dominic. So Dominic goes between here and Loxton. Um, so he can actually facilitate that for you. Um, so yeah, if there's any, anything you want to come out and you want to see the dashboards, you want to use the Moby shears yourself or anything like that, we can facilitate that. Um, so it's just really a call or an email um, set up at the time, which is convenient for, for both. Yeah, we're fairly flexible. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, just a comment, with um, involving yourself with the ag tech people, we're involved with um, Airborne Logic with Andy and as part of the development, they ask us what we want, rather than the supplier saying, this is what we're giving you. So I fully support people, and they've come before, of asking those suppliers what you want to know, mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. And Andy, just as a plug, does a fantastic job in asking those questions of us. So I um, fully support, question them and question them and question them. Speaking of Andy again, um, you know, one of, one of the things that I think about ag tech is you've got this precision, you know, ag tech, 
I know with growers with Utipa redevelopment, there's a huge overwhelm in terms of where do I start? And I think that's a big role that ag tech plays is to help you decide where to start. If you start in the wrong block, you could be wasting your time, wasting your money, or maybe you should have pulled it out instead of reworking it. So from my point of view, does anyone else have a comment on that from the panel? I mean, we, we, um, we've tried to tackle this issue, issue of Utipa, Utipa reworking with some of our tools that we, we provided growers because we realise it's an issue, this overwhelm issue, and I think data can help you with that. Have you seen any examples of that, you guys? Yeah, I, I probably can't quote one specific right now, but I think there are scenarios, especially to um, James's point about development, there's got to be a lot of collaboration, which there is, whether it be from people, you know, like managers, um, consultants, growers on the ground, researchers. It's a journey together. I kind of, that sounds all a bit warm and fuzzy, I know, but there's sometimes I've got to, I guess, sometimes you just need to get the data. And I think we've got to get the data and sometimes we may not know what to do with it. I'm not talking about a, a small grower scenario, if I can use that term, but um, at a development level, sometimes we've just got to get the data and, and then later on we'll find what we can do with it. Because quite often I think the benefits are probably things we haven't even thought of yet. I know, you know, having discussions with Andy likewise with some of the work we're doing in, in the vine improvement propagation sector about virus detection. We, we're not really sure how it's all going to go, but we've just got to get on with it. And I think to your question, Rob, sort of, um, sometimes that process is really powerful to understand, you know, the benefit cost ratios. We've just got to take it for a spin. And I think the other thing I know, I'll, I'll uh, quote Andy here, a great little uh, analogy is sometimes the things, they might be a one solve. There might be a, almost like a forensic scenario, finding a problem, fix it, and a subscription is not suitable to that. It could be just a one-off fee, a one-off job, and subscriptions are fine for other things, dynamic things. Um, and, you know, again, um, sorry, I'll keep stealing one of your analogies about the, the different technologies. We don't all need a Ferrari to take the kids to school. Kids will love it, but it's a bit unnecessary. Um, sometimes the good old hog newt, so to speak, will do the job. So it's got to be fit for purpose, and that, I think, is a critical piece of where that benefit cost comes in. So, uh, James, any comment? Or, oh. I don't know what to really add to that one. Um, I, I, I guess as a manager, you should have a pretty good feel on your own property. Um, and when you... You're living in there every day. Um, you see what needs to be done and doesn't need to be done. And um, I guess you could use a block like Cabernet. Um, and if it's getting an older block, and uh, do you, you know, do you look at um, reworking it or do you look at grubbing it? And I think uh, you have to take into account how many vines are in there and do have dieback and things like that. Um, and I don't know my past experience on, on most of reworking older blocks. Um, unless it's really high-end fruit, you're better off to uh, grub and rework it, uh, grub and replant it, sorry. And uh, then you've got a nice new vineyard again for the next umpteen years. So I don't know if that sort of helps answer that question. But you also need to know where your property's at. For us, when I started where I am right now two years ago, the irrigation system was in need of repair. We've repaired a portion of it. That's going better now. We're slowly going to move on. We're now going to automate the system. So it's about grabbing the tools that you need when you need them. Don't step too far in front because suddenly you've got all this information and it's great information, but you can't actually put it onto your property yet because your property hasn't got to that space yet. So you need to be slowly stepping that property forward before you can use that information. So again, my continual point is one step at a time and use what's relevant for your property. Don't jump in. In our case, irrigation system could not have handled what we've talked about today until we fix that. So one step at a time. This might be going back to something we talked about earlier, but um, a question to the panel in terms of what you would say to the ag tech suppliers is, you know, there's a lot of talk in the agricultural um, scene in terms of even if a grower can see a change and an improvement or a return on investment, or you know, more profitability, they still might not take up that change. Do you think there's a need for the ag tech companies to um, understand you know, behavioural psychology at all, in terms of helping growers with that change? Because it's, it's, it's very easy to talk about technical things 
it would help if you talked about the benefits more, but is there something in that behavioural change, you know, psychology that you need in your team to be able to get people to transfer to this technology? It's, it's a very, very tricky question, but it's, yeah, it, it is. it's a phenomenon. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think, like any growth, they're going to invest five, ten, twenty thousand dollars um, they want to see some sort of improvement um, with um, also the end sale of their product as well. So, um, but uh, it's, it's also working closely with your wine company who, you, who you're selling your grapes with. And uh, if um, um, your GLO you know, comes out and thinks, geez, this, the system you're using here, you've got, got fantastic results, your, gra your grapes are going to go up to an extra grade, uh, you'll, get, a, you'll um, get extra money for this fruit. Um, and then that leads on to um, you know just doing more and better improvements in your vineyard all the time. Um, you've, I guess it doesn't matter what you invest in, you've got to be able to see the re rewards at the end of the day mm. um, and, and get those rewards back. And if that's going to happen, it's, uh, it should flow fairly easy. But, um, um, to, uh, for the ag tech guys to uh, get out there and sell to the growers, I, I don't know what the answer is to that actually. I think it's make it personal and actually be a site visit and actually see you um, not get the phone call from Sydney um, representing the international who's um, sitting in Spain. Um, come out and site and actually talk the language with the grower. Mm -hmm. Comments, Chris, at all? Um, yeah, yes, it's, well, it's interesting. I think in um, agriculture, it's very community based. So I guess sometimes I think it's a case of try and encourage people to work with their neighbour. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. But uh, there's certainly opportunities, I think, where there might be efficiencies possible where a group of people in a given area get together. And and as I think, as in, uh, we all know, in, uh, in our sector, it is very much over the fence kind of things. But I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is to take that in the next step. What if those people that, that, that are over the fence and they get along and they share a lot of knowledge, what if they can go, well, let's together have a go at something. Um, and sort of learning together. And I, I think that just helps bring a bit more confidence into that, into those participants in that little group. And I guess to elaborate on something that was brought up earlier, this is not a specific example, but the, um, to that, but Rob, you asked about the weather station network. Um, there is certainly gonna be a level of caution about sharing information. Some are very free to share, some aren't. But we also need to be careful with that scenario. We, to be honest, I think we'd, with the work I do with Nikki and BGW across Australia, we probably would hesitate about soil moisture because it's not going to be applicable. Um, and we wouldn't want people to use it. Oh, that sensor down at Fred's place is saying this, I should do this. I think we have to be uh, obviously, you know, making encouraging people to tailor that. The, the regionals, where the network gets used in various levels, some people are just curious. Um, other people probably would use that data if it's nearby for their spray diary. So they straight away go, oh, that's cool. That, that's quite handy for me. So yeah, I think let's leverage that community and, and collective kind of a mindset instead of sort of leaving people on their, on, their, on their own sometimes. Yeah, so just to reiterate, we, we have you know, collaborated um, with the vineyard owners who have had an ex terroir project with a station on their properties. What's the website to get into that and have a look at those Weather stations, Chris, Greenbrain. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's on my phone. Um, yeah. I think it's greenbrain.org. Just Google, actually, I think you might even be able to Google MEA Barossa. Um, MEA Barossa. Yeah, so, uh, yep. but for those of you in the Barossa, um, just contact Nikki, she can, you know, I think you've got yep. that. Yeah, yep. it's pretty easy to find. And there's, yeah, 17 stations there from all different sites yep. that you can look at. So, and, and I guess the Video Watch bulletin I provide. I do that in Clare Valley and Barossa, I use that a lot as well. And also I would just say, I mean, as I mentioned before, um, we, we'd hope to trial um, the Athena plant stress sensory um, tool on one of our demo vineyards this coming growing season. Um, so just keep an ear out on the Barossa Australia newsletter for when we're having demonstration days. Um, it's a good way to, you know, look over the vineyard fence at what other growers are doing or what we're helping growers trial on their vineyards and then you know you don't have to trial it yourself you can actually see how it's going somewhere else before you take that leap so please look out for those grower days where we have a grower field day come along because and ask you know obviously recommend there's a lot of people not here today I can't see 
that many growers in the shed today, so please pass that on. Um, I just wanted to say, Nikki, um, thank you Ooh. very, very much for being our MC today. So very, very grateful for you doing that. And Pleasure. to our um, presenters as well, so thank you very much for taking part in the, in the panel. But thank you very much all for coming. And all.